Hello and welcome to our online event. My name is Emily Whitehouse and I'm Associate Director of Admissions at the Yale School of Management for the Master's Degree Program in Asset Management. And today I'm joined by my colleague Laurel Grodman, Managing Director of Admissions at Yale SOM and alumna of the Yale School of Management. And Laurel and I actually both serve as admissions officers on the Asset Management Admissions Committee. Good morning, Laurel. Thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure, Emily. Great, thank you so much. And so our aim today is to provide you with a brief overview of the school and the program, of course, and then dive right into the application, offering some tips and some advice on preparing your best asset management application. And so we'll then open for questions pretty soon after. Uh, so I'm asking that you please use the Q&A feature. Our colleague Rachel is working uh, kind of behind the scenes for today and we'll be taking your questions and kind of looking through seeing what the most common ones are. And if you have questions that are more specific to your individual case, don't hesitate to reach out and contact us by email. We'll share that at the end of the presentation. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to share a little bit about the Yale School of Management and what makes this new master's program in asset management distinctive. So I think the best place to start is, of course, with our school's mission, which is to educate leaders for business and society. This mission is shared across degree programs, and it truly informs everything that we do. And it means that our aim is to develop leaders who have the ability to think broadly about complex problems we face in a really increasingly complex world. And for people to learn to have the ability to make decisions in which there's multiple stakeholders, influencers, and consequences. And so I think the most defining feature of all the students at Yale SOM is that they care both about being successful in their careers and also having a positive impact on society. And at the Yale School of Management, you'll find a close connection to the greater Yale community and Yale University. So when you're joining the Yale SOM community, you're also joining the Yale University community. And this connection is something that we feel our students should choose to leverage because you'll find lots of great resources across campus, um, access to the sharpest minds in academia, and all of the benefits of being a part of a world-renowned institution. So all of our degree programs do allow you to take electives both in and outside of the Yale School of Management, as well as to attend conferences, hackathons, guest speakers, and more. So let's dive in a little bit to the master's degree program in asset management. This one year degree program is ideal for recent university graduates and those who are early in their career. Um, it's roughly, we would say about zero to five years of work experience is who this programming is really ideal for. And so ap applicants to this program must have completed a bachelor's degree by the time the program is slated to start, which would be fall of 2021. So this master's degree program was created and is co-directed by Professor Tobias Moskowitz, who is Dean Takahashi Professor of Finance at Yale School of Management. And he also serves as principal at AQR Capital Management and David Swenson, the Chief Investment Officer of the Yale Investments Office. So the two of them saw that Yale is uniquely positioned to educate students, and foster cutting edge research in the field of asset management. And so the motivation behind developing this program was to fill a need and a demand that they saw for a finance program devoted to asset management. The program leverages Yale's strength in finance. And I think that Toby and David, and David um, are using their resources to make this program a really incredible experience. And both are slated to teach in the program th themselves but have also called upon Yale's university's top finance scholars and leading investment managers at some of the world's most successful firms. Uh, Professor Moskowitz has stated in the past that this program would serve as an excellent substitute for an in-house training you may otherwise receive at a firm if you started working direct from undergraduate study. And this program aims to offer less idiosyncratic and from specific knowledge and instead focuses more on practice and theory of asset management with an emphasis on fiduciary responsibility. 
So as a result of, require, of acquiring those skills in, in this program, uh, he sees more potential career and geographic mobility as being possible. And if admitted from very early on, you'll have the full support of the Yale SOM Career Development Office as their team offers summer workshops, networking opportunities, and a myriad of resources to you all the way through graduation and beyond. And for those interested, a joint degree option is also available between the full-time MBA program and the asset management program, making it possible to earn both degrees in just two years, or for those coming direct from undergraduate study, um, there is of course the MBA Silver Scholar option in which um, if admitted to that program, you would have um, a slightly longer extended internship period in between your two years of study um, at Yale SOM. International applicants may be interested to know as well that we have um, within this program the opportunity to qualify for an additional two year STEM extension. It's part of the post completion OPT work permission and it's important, however, to note that the STEM field designation is only the first qualification here in a series of eligibility criteria, and the final decision rests with the, the Department of Homeland Security. And so I'll get a little bit into the curriculum, but not too deep here. We have lots of great content online and previous recorded events that you can dive into to learn more about our offerings there. But you can see from this slide that the curriculum really covers the breadth of the investment industry, um, covering a lot of different quantitative models, traditional fundamental analysis, alternative investing, as well as client relation issues. And the courses will be rigorous, similar to the PhD level, um, but very much leaning more into like a practical application. And so the curriculum is a combination of both required and elective courses, designed specifically for this program, the cross-registration opportunities do exist across Yale. These unique courses um, will be offered in topics such as portfolio management, implementation, alternative asset classes, the legal landscape, which will be taught by Yale Law School faculty, risk management, and socially responsible and ethical investment objectives. And so this comprehensive curriculum provides exposure to a broad range of assets, including traditional equity and bond markets, absolute return strategies, credit, private equity, uh, real estate, and nat natural resources, uh, to name a few. But of course, the highlight of this program is the colloquium in asset management, which will bring leading executives, investors, practitioners, um, all to campus for discussions with students. And through these interactions, students will gain exposure to world-renowned speakers from industry sourced means through, pro through our program directors and through the Yale Investments Office. And students are required to gain some practical experience as well as part of the curriculum through one of the following options, uh, one of which would be working while completing the program, um, interning from mid-December through the end of January with the support of our career development office or conducting a research project or an independent study on campus. So without further ado, <laughs> um, we will go ahead and dive into the application process. But first, let me just offer a couple of brief notes about uh, the types of candidates this program was developed for. So this program is for candidates who have a demonstrated interest in the field, but of course we're open to all academic majors. Applicants should have a strong quantitative background, including coursework in multivariable calculus, linear algebra, probability and statistics. Um, and applicants should also have some coursework or experience in computer programming. Now this coursework or experience does not have to be completed at the time of applying to the program, but should be completed before classes start. And coursework in advanced mathematics, beyond calculus and economic theory would be excellent additional preparation. And a STEM degree or quantitatively focused business degree is an excellent preparation, but is certainly not a requirement. So this program in sum was developed by um, Toby and David with early career professionals in mind, having roughly zero to five years of work experience. And relevant work experience and internships within the field of asset management or financial services 
um, are certainly helpful, but they're not necessarily required either. So on this slide, you'll see laid out all of the components of this application, uh, some of which you are likely familiar with and will be submitting to multiple schools. And Laurel and I will spend some time going through each component in more detail and then take some of your questions live. So I'll turn it over to her to begin. Great, thanks so much, Emily. And thanks to everyone again for joining us today. As Emily mentioned, we'll get into some of the specific components of the application in just a moment. Um, I'll just draw your attention to a couple of, of overall uh, thoughts. So our application can be completed online. It's very easily access, uh, accessed through our website. We have just one single application deadline and that's on January 13th. We won't begin reviewing applications before that, but please do make sure to have your application submitted by the 13th of January. After that deadline, we'll start reviewing applications and in, um, issue interview invitations. Though keep in mind, and we'll get into the interview a little bit more later, do keep in mind not everyone who is admitted to the program will necessarily be invited to interview. It is not a requirement of admissions. Um, and then with that, we will wrap up uh, the application cycle on April 9th, where you'll hear a decision from our office. And so why don't we launch into some of the individual components of the application and we'll start first with the academic profile. So um, I guess it's important to think about how that academic profile fits into the overall uh, evaluation of your application. We take a holistic approach to, review, to reviewing your applications and just one piece of that puzzle is your, your academics. It's obviously a very important one, um, but we view all of the aspects and components of your application in tandem with one another. So there's no one single part of the application that is going to be completely determinative of your outcome. So let's think about the academic profile. What we're really looking at there are your transcripts and your test scores. Um, these are the items that allow us to gauge your potential for success in what is, a, a, as Emily described, a very rigorous master's level program. So it's important to know we look beyond just the GPA that appears at the end of your transcript. Um, we are really digging into those transcripts and looking at your performance over time, your quantitative exposure. Again, as Emily noted, this is a, a very rigorous quantitative program. Um, program. So while no particular set of courses is a requirement, we will certainly be looking for evidence of that quantitative exposure in the in various coursework that you've taken. Um, we're obviously looking at the grades that you achieved in your individual courses and not just that GPA at the end. Similarly, uh, test scores aren't everything, but we look at them because they are a proven marker for future success in a management program. Um, and so we are really looking at those GMAT or GRE scores um, in conjunction with your GPA and looking to sort of fit those two pieces of the puzzle together. Um, we do not have a minimum score requirement um, and we don't have an average or sort of range to share because this is the inaugural class that you're looking to join. Um, but as I mentioned, we don't sort of have a, a minimum threshold that we're looking for there. And we are test agnostic, so we're equally happy to accept your GMAT or your GRE scores. We don't have a preference there. Um, many of you may know that if you take the GMAT or the GRE more than once, you have the ability to um, either share or hide multiple test results. Um, I would encourage you to share your test history. It can be helpful. Uh, while we don't combine uh, sections from different tests, um, it is useful to sort of see your testing on, on various dates. Um, you may, for instance, have achieved a higher individual quantitative score in a, a test setting that wasn't your highest combined score. So that's useful for us to see and consider as well um, and would be helpful in, in allowing us to gauge your quantitative preparation. The one other area of testing that we require um, is English language testing. So if your native language is not English um, and you have not completed a degree in an English speaking country, we will require that you submit either the TOEFL or the IELTS exam. Um, those, uh, those test scores are valid for two years. Um, and so for applicants applying in uh, January 2021, we'll accept a TOEFL or an IELTS taken within two years of the date of your application submission. So just be mindful of those testing dates. Um, Let's see, when, uh, so when assessing your English language ability, this isn't the only thing that we are looking at. We're using your test scores in conjunction with any other experiences that you've had in an English speaking setting, such as internships or study abroad. 
um, as, as well as information that we're going to glean from some of the other components of the application that we talk about in, in just a bit. And so once again, much like the GMAT and the GRE, we don't have a preference for whether you sit for the TOEFL or the IELTS. It's the, it's the one that you choose to do. Um, so with that, that pretty much captures the academic uh, profile uh, elements of your application. I'll pass it back to Emily to talk a little bit about professional experience. Great, thanks, Laurel. Um, so let's take a look at the professional experience. So first and foremost, the resume, which is something you'll be giving over to any school you're applying for, of course. Um, it's a very important part of your application and it should really showcase your academic experiences, any professional experiences that you've had, any volunteer work or other activities that help to tell your story. And so in the Yale SOM application, you'll see that we provide a resume template for you to use if you would like to do that. And you'll see that we recommend a one page resume, very clearly communicated work progression, start and end dates as well as space for high level academic experiences and additional information that you may choose to include. So if you have a gap in your work experience or academic history, we do encourage you to use the optional statement to provide an explanation and we'll go into that a little bit later as well. Um, as for the resume, my biggest advice there, I think, is to think about your impacts and how you're conveying those impacts in your resume in a succinct and thoughtful way. Um, so my biggest advice is to really keep it concise, um, keep it to you know, particular projects that you were instrumental in working on, um, and feel free to share a little bit of your personality and things that you're interested in and, and things like that too. It doesn't have to be completely rote um, and very, very serious. There, there is room for, for you to add a little bit of color and personality as well. Um, but think through, make sure to keep it to one page, especially if you're within the zero to five years of work experience. We think it should be very doable um, to have a, a, a good use of white space on your resume, um, but also to keep it on one, on one just one page. Anyhow, uh, let's get into the letters of recommendation. So we do require two letters of recommendation and these are, um, two letters that are either academic or professional in nature, we'd prefer one of each. And the best people to write letters of recommendation for you are people who have supervised you, um, either you know, formally reviewed your performance in the classroom or on the job. So we recommend asking someone like that as opposed to asking someone who maybe has a really prestigious title at your university or at your workplace. Um, and if your recommender's primary language is not English, then um, please know that we're reviewing for content versus ability there. And at this time, we do provide translation services for recommendations that are submitted in Mandarin and Spanish. So many candidates think that this piece of the application is completely out of their hands, but I believe this is a piece that you can influence in a couple of ways. So I would always encourage candidates to connect with their recommenders, maybe schedule a call um, and talk through uh, why you're interested in pursuing a master's degree program in asset management. And more importantly, why now? Why do you feel this makes sense for you at this point in your life? Um, it would also be helpful to them probably for you to jog their memory about specific projects or experiences that you had under their stead and um, different things that the admissions committee might benefit from hearing about you from them. And so in this way, you're priming your recommenders to be reflective and thoughtful about writing a letter for you. And it will help to shed more light on your performance at work or in the classroom, your trajectory, and your potential to excel in the program. So really quick on that point as well. Um, all you'll need to do within the application is share the contact information of your employer or your professor and go ahead and um, submit that. Make sure that these two individuals are the two you want to be contacted um, because sometimes um, applicants will change their mind and their recommender will get an email and then they'll say, oh, whoops, I didn't mean to 
to send that contact information. And sometimes that leads to some confusion by the person you're requesting the letter from when they're unable to access that information. So that's another piece of advice. Make sure you've selected the two letters of recommendation that you're wanting. You've shared only their contact information um, and then just you can feel free to stay in touch with them. They, of course, need to author the letter completely. It needs to be 100% their work, but you're certainly welcome to check in with them and remind them of the deadline as needed. Oh, and on that point, we give a little bit of extra time there too. Uh, so you have about a week after submitting your application for those recommendations to get to us. And I'll turn it over to Laurel to talk about the essays. Thank you, Emily. So our our philosophy on the uh, the application to this program at large is to be very economical. So we don't ask you uh, superfluous information that isn't going away into our evaluation process. And so with that, we have uh, kept our essays very kind of brief and straightforward. We are essentially asking you um, why you're interested in the Yale SO master's degree program in asset management. So I think it's useful to think of this question as giving you an opportunity to discuss what you want to dis uh, what you want to accomplish during the program and then your short-term goals immediately coming out of the program. And then the second essay is sort of the complement to that. It asks you to reflect on what you hope to accomplish in the asset management field more broadly. So think of this question as posing an opportunity to explain your long-term career interests. Both of these essays have a 300 uh, word limit to them and you don't need to feel obligated to meet those limits. Um, you, can, you can answer both of these questions probably in a very concise and, and uh, defined way, which hopefully you're able to do. You're, you're pursuing a master's in a very specialized field. And so we're looking just to understand that you have a comprehension of that field. And well, we of course appreciate that interests can change. And we do hope that this program opens your eyes to experiences you may not have even considered in the field of asset management. It's very helpful to go into a program like this, at least with a broad sense of what you're hoping to get out of it, both in the short term and the long term. So that's what we're looking to understand from the combination of these two essays. Um, general kind of essay essay writing tips. So um, I hope it goes without saying the, the content should obviously be your own um, and you are the author of that essay. But of course, it's very helpful to have a, uh, a, a second set of eyes to proofread to make sure that you don't have any um, any um, errors that you'd want to clean up before uh, before submitting it. But of course, once again, the content must be your own. Um, these are fairly straightforward essays, so I hope that um, I hope that they'll pass this test. But one thing that can be useful um, in making sure that you've kind of stayed on topic is to have someone read your essay without seeing what the topic is. Um, so don't submit the essay prompt to them. Just give them your essay and have them guess what you were asked to do. And if they come pretty close to uh, to the essay prompt, you know that you've you've sort of stuck to the task there. So that's something that you may also try as well. We, um, we do also have a, uh, an optional information section of the application. It's not really an essay. It doesn't need to be a whole long drawn out thing. Um, and the important thing to know here is most candidates absolutely do not need to complete this section. It's really there um, if you need to address some unanswered question um, that may pop up elsewhere in your application that you feel like you need to give some supporting information for. So maybe there's a gap in your resume that you wanna provide an explanation for. Um, maybe you end up choosing an, uncon uh, an unconventional, unconventional recommender and you wanna give us a little bit more context to why you perhaps didn't choose an immediate supervisor. Um, this is an opportunity to very briefly uh, state um, uh, some information about some of those choices or other elements of your application. It's definitely not another essay, um, but more kind of a brief prompt if you need to give us that additional information. And I'll pass it back to Emily to talk about the video questions. Yeah, okay. So let's talk about video questions. This is something else that um, some folks get a little bit nervous about, but I promise that there's no, no need to be concerned, right? So the last step in submitting your application for the Yale School of Management is the video question component, which is a unique feature at Yale SOM. So although you might find this a little bit intimidating, I think you'll see this also as a unique opportunity to speak directly to the admissions committee. 
And so the video question component was initially developed as a replacement for a test of English language proficiency. Um, but we've seen that it helps us to determine um, a lot of a lot of great just opportunity to, to get in touch with you and see you face to face and put face and name to application. And so you'll be recorded through your computer camera answering the questions. And these are not trick questions. And the only preparation I would recommend is to use the simulation tool offered within the platform and just to get comfortable with the technology. But let's dig into this just a little bit more. So with regard to timing, um, you'll receive the video questions after you've submitted your application and paid your application fee. So this is not necessarily due on January 13th unless you've submitted early for whatever reason. Um, but then you will find that you will have two randomized previously recorded questions that are being asked of you by an admissions team member. So the questions we ask are similar to a typical interview style question. So again, this is not a trick question and we're really not trying to stump you. Um, this is just an opportunity for us to see how you think on your feet. Um, and so you will have 20 to 30 seconds to gather your thoughts and 60 to 90 seconds to deliver uh, that response. And so you don't need to fill the entire response time and you can certainly complete each answer and end the recording at any point in which you feel comfortable. So a couple of tips to think about, become familiar with the response time frame. So your first question will be 20 seconds to gather your thoughts and 60 seconds to respond. And so this question might be a little bit more cut and dry um, and it might be a little bit easier just to get your answer out in under 60 seconds, but feel free to actually time yourself responding to some behavior, to some typical behavioral interview questions. And you'll see that that's actually quite a bit of time and you, you can definitely make the most of it, um, but that will help you from feeling like you've left something un unsaid um, or maybe spent too much time when you could have answered it a little bit more succinctly. So I definitely recommend practicing. The practice tool available on the platform is really great. Um, I think it's very intuitive. I've, I've done some video questions myself to test the technology and see what um, our applicants are experiencing. And I think it is pretty intuitive and user-friendly. Um, and I recommend using that simulation tool, testing your camera and microphone, and taking a moment to get comfortable with the technology before really seriously beginning. And of course, finding a good internet connection in a quiet private space. Sometimes that's easier said than done if you're living with roommates or you have uh, lots of noisy pets, but uh, this is a very short exercise. And so if you can find uh, 10, 20 minutes to make sure that everything can be quiet for you and that you're in a nice, quiet, uncluttered space. Um, and just dress in something that makes you feel confident and professional as if you're sitting down for a face-to-face -face interview and just present your best self and do great because we know you might feel a little bit nervous, but we really want you to shine uh, in this component of the application. And we do review it last among all of your materials. So we're reviewing the whole application first and then taking a look at the video questions. So I'll turn it back over to Laurel for interviews. Thank you, Emily. So interviews tend to come last in the series of, of tests that you complete for, um, for your application. And sometimes it can take on the feeling of being the final kind of determination of whether you are admitted to a program or not. Um, and it's a matter of, did you do well in the interview or did you not do well? Um, let me assure you that is not how we are, are viewing the interview component of the process. Um, it is one of many elements of the application, as you've seen, that we're looking at. And we're, in our final review of your applications, taking the interview in context of everything else that you're doing. So it's not sort of the final determinative factor. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it is not even a required element of, uh, for admission. So we will begin reviewing applications after the deadline, as I mentioned, and as we move through the application pool, some candidates will be extended an, inter an invitation to interview. But as I said, the interview is not required to gain admission. Um, we may decide to, in to issue an interview for a variety of different reasons. Um, 
This is in a kind of a comprehensive list, but it can include um, providing further confirmation of English language proficiency above and beyond um, the English language exam score. So it gives us another opportunity above and beyond the test, above and beyond the video questions to have a live conversation and get a sense of your uh, English language ability. More generally, whether you're a native speaker or not, the interview does give us a, a little bit of a sense of how you're able to articulate um, yourself on your feet as, as do the video questions, which is a valuable skill to have in the classroom as well as in um, your professional lives beyond. We may decide to interview you to ask some clarifying questions um, about the, uh, the courses that you've taken or the internships you've had, the work experiences, um, so it gives us an opportunity to, to follow up on some information that we may need to dig into a little bit more. Um, so if you are invited for an interview, that invitation could really come at any point within the round. Um, we'll start sending out invitations shortly after the application deadline on a rolling basis, but don't get concerned if you haven't received an interview invitation. And I definitely encourage you not to reach out to the admissions office to follow up on, uh, on whether you will be receiving an interview invitation or not. Like I said, those invitations can be coming at any point um, sort of in the process as, we, uh, as we're reviewing applications. So your best uh, bet is just to sit tight and, and wait, which I know can be difficult. Um, should we invite you to interview, the interview itself this year will take place virtually using an online video conferencing platform. In a, in a typical year, we would have some opportunity for live interviews, but obviously that's not going to be a possibility for this, um, for this upcoming cycle. Um, so just some general interview tips. Uh, remember the basics. You want to be on time. You want to be professionally dressed and come prepared and, and ready to go. The interview itself, much like the video questions, is not meant to trip you up or involve kind of trick questions. Um, it's the sort of interview preparation you would do for a job, for you know, if you were going on a job interview. So you want to know yourself and your resume and some of the the highlights and, and achievements that you that you bring to the table, um, and come prepared to to discuss them in a way that you would in a typical job interview. Uh, similarly, you want to have some intelligent questions ready for your interviewer. So. Um, this is information that's not readily accessible on the website and that you can just sort of look up on your own. Um, it's good to keep in mind the interview is really a two-way street. So obviously we're looking to learn more about you, but it's also an opportunity for you to learn more about our school and community. So really give some thought to what are some of the questions that you'd like to ask, uh, that you would like to ask the interviewer. Um, and then generally look at your interviewer as a potential uh, resource for you even beyond the space of that interview. So you're always welcome to reach out after the interview. If you have any follow-up questions, uh, we wanna be a resource. So don't think that that connection ends at the point of the interview. I think that covers uh, sort of the breadth of the, uh, of the application experience. So um, I'll turn it back to Emily, who I think will be guiding us through uh, the Q&A portion of the event. Yeah, Laurel, so lots of great questions came in. Um, there were actually some pre-submitted questions as well when those uh, folks registered for the event in advance. And so, um, of course, we have lots of folks turning, um, tuning in, and we'd like to answer as many questions as possible, and we have till 11 together. Um, so, as I said, please, if you're still kind of thinking on your questions and mulling things over, keep them as general as possible um, versus specific to your situation and using the Q&A feature to get those through to us. So, I'm going to go ahead and back it up a bit. Um, of course, now this is going to take forever <laughs> because of each bullet point. Um, I wanted to get back to the slide with all of the components, which I will do. Um, but for now, let's just end the slideshow um, and get back to um, the main screen here. So I'll stop the share um, and we'll go from there. So let's take a look at what's come in so far. And I see here that we have some joint degree questions, Laurel. So um, some individuals are wondering if it's possible to apply to this program after being admitted to the full-time MBA program. And given that um, you have so much experience with that department, um, I'll let you answer. Sure, so, um, so the way, as, as I think Emily touched upon before, that the joint degree program is, is structured is you would complete your 
first year in kind of the MBA core curriculum as, as sort of your first stop. And then your second year of the of your MBA program in general can always be completed through any electives throughout uh, Yale University and certainly at the School of Management. So essentially your asset management degree would be your elective year and you would take your coursework according to, to sort of the requirements of that program. And so it does mean that you would need to, if you are pursuing the joint degree, you would have to complete that MBA year first. So the options for that are either to apply to both programs from the outset. And so you, you know, apply separately and are evaluated through each of those admissions pro, uh, processes. And it's important to note, they are separate applications, separate, uh, separate evaluation processes. And so you would have to be admitted to each of those programs. Um, and if you were, you would again, start an MBA program and then do the, the asset management in your second year. Um, alternatively, you could apply to the asset management program in the first year of your MBA program. So if you decided to start the MBA program in the coming year, over the course of that year, you would um, apply to asset management and could be admitted to similarly complete that degree in the second year. Oh, I, you're muted, Emily. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Has to happen at least once per session. Um, so. Yeah, let's take a look at some of the other questions we have received here. I see a question about um, so an easy one. What is the department code for TOEFL submission? That is C472. Um, and that's also listed on our website under our application information. You can go tab by tab and all of the school codes for GMAT, GRE. Um, and TOEFL are all on there. IELTS actually doesn't require any special code. Um, you just indicate that you'd like it sent to um, the Asset Management Master's program and they get that over to us. So that's nice and easy. Um, so some other um, testing related questions that have come through. So let's go through some of those. So Laurel, if you can answer this question, do you waive the GMAT based on past professional experience or other master's degrees conferred? We do not. So the that testing requirement is there regardless of what other kind of professional experience you've had, academic experience. Um, so we will require, as we said before, either a GRE or a GMAT from, from all the applicants. And someone else is asking about what's considered an acceptable GMAT or GRE score, and is there a minimum requirement? I'm happy to answer that. Um, there is no minimum test score requirement for any of our programs at Yale SOM. Um, I will say, you know, to echo what Laurel said earlier, that um, of course we are admitting our inaugural class. And therefore we don't have class profile information or data that we can make available to the public on um, what sorts of um, test scores our incoming students have. And so let's see, um, do higher grades in English proficiency make an applicant more competitive or will it be regarded as equal as long as the grade meets a requirement such as a 100 on the TOEFL? I think for this, um, question, I would say um, having strong um, IELTS or TOEFL scores is a sign that you will be comfortable with classes that are being conducted fully in English. Um, as Laurel said prior, it's just one component of, um, of kind of our ability to assess your, um, your ability to be successful in a program that's taught completely in English. So it is just one piece of the puzzle. So don't be too discouraged if you have you know, a bit under that. And there's also other ways that you're going to be able to demonstrate your English language proficiency, such as through the video questions, through the GMAT or GRE verbal section. Um, and there are, there are some other ways that, that you can demonstrate that as well. And also there's a question now about um, tuition and scholarship support and Laurel, if you can talk about, are there any full scholarships or um, scholarships that are available for this program? So the, uh, our, our methodology for awarding scholarships is this is a merit-based uh, scholarship evaluation. So as opposed to need-based where we're assessing your financial situation, 
Um, we, do, we do not do need-based aid for this program. We are assessing a merit. And the good news is there's no separate application process for a scholarship. Every candidate that we admit to the program, we are simultaneously evaluating for merit scholarship potential. And so um, I think the straightforward way to look at, at it is all of the elements of the application that, that we talked about um, are sort of the same things that we're looking at to, to um, evaluate for scholarship. So sort of superf superfluid, superfluid <laughs> um, uh, ability, I'm tongue tied today, <laughs> um, to, to demonstrate sort of ac academic achievement or professional achievement. Um, we are looking for kind of the best of the best on those dimensions as we're thinking about uh, uh, scholarship. We're also thinking about some of the elements that we perhaps didn't emphasize quite as much as we walk through the application process, but we're, you know, we're looking at how you've been a part of your communities as well. So people who have really gone above and beyond um, to uh, be sort of an active uh, leader and contributor to the, to the academic and professional and other communities you've been a part of. And we believe that you'll bring that element to the, um, to the SOM community as well. That's another kind of important consideration in evaluating for merit-based scholarship. But the key takeaway there is there's nothing separate that you need to do to be considered for a scholarship to this program. Absolutely. Uh, and so one question that we're getting quite a bit of is, um, folks wondering how um, the postponement of the program in fall 2020, um, how that impacts um, the size of the class we're seeking to admit for this year. Um, and I will say this. So for those of you tuning in that aren't aware, um, this program was set to launch for fall 2020 and we had admitted an excellent class uh, to begin that program. But of course, COVID-19 had other plans. And so what was decided was that we would postpone the program one academic year, and we offered the option to defer um, to our incoming class for fall 2020. Now, the first class of this program was always meant to be very small and rather niche um, because of course, Toby and David Swenson were planning on having a program that has a high touch between faculty and our practicing investors um, and Toby and David themselves. And so we've, we had always intended for year one to be rather small. And so you will be, if admitted to this program, joining those individuals that were admitted last year. And they're an incredible group. Um, and they're so excited to meet all of you and to hopefully join together in fall 2021. Um, this actually has no impact on the size of the class we're looking to admit this year. Um, we don't release that information um, and we will share more about the profiles of those already admitted with the students that we admit in this cycle so that everyone can begin to network and connect and, and get to know one another before classes start. Um, but we won't be releasing that information until then. Um, but I think all that to say, we're extremely excited. We intend to admit roughly the same amount this year as we did last year to join the, um, the existing um, class from 2020-21. So hopefully that meets everyone's questions on that point. And so let's see. I'll add there, um, as, as far as joining this group, um, one exciting thing is many of them have already begun engaging in the Yale community through uh, other degree work in this sort of intervening year. So some are pursuing an MBA joint degree, some of them are um, in, involved in one of our other master's programs. And so they'll already kind of have been integrated into the Yale SOM community. I think will be a great resource to anyone joining that group uh, for the incoming year. That's absolutely right. Yes, most definitely. Um, and so let's see, uh, some questions about our timeline, Laurel. So in what order does your team review application materials? Will you take a look at the resume, for instance, before reading the essays? Um, this person is feeling that it will help them to understand how much detail of educational background and work experience they need to provide in the essay before discussing their goals elsewhere in the application, just to avoid confusion. So what do you think there? Yeah, I mean, there's no prescriptive way in which uh, someone reviewing an application will go through it. Sort of the only, the only directive is we, we do view the video questions as the last step, um, and we have various reasons for doing that, but essentially we want to kind of 
get to know the application you've put together before sort of connecting with you face to face in a way. Um, but the rest of it can really be reviewed in any order. And I wouldn't worry so much about, um, you know, sort of creating a linear path for us in that way. I mean, we're all highly kind of ex trained and experienced reviewers of applications and um, are certainly used to going back and thinking about an element of the application in a new light when um, new information has, has come up sort of later on. And so just make sure that you're covering your bases as you think about the application in its entirety. So you don't necessarily have to make the same point in three different places. You can rest assured we'll, you know, we'll see something if you put it in the optional statement or we'll see something if you put it in your essay. Um, and we'll be able to go back and reflect upon um, other elements of your application that we've already kind of reviewed. So I, I wouldn't spend too much time worrying about kind of the order that we're going through things. Yeah, and, and a similar process question is um, someone was asking in what order does our team read the two short essays because they're using an, an acronym in essay one. And they want to know if they need to define it again in essay two. I think I, I think we can figure that out. Um, and I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that most of us tend to read essay one and then essay two because I think it just makes sense in kind of the telling of your story. What do you plan to do at Yale SOM and kind of in the short term? And then how does that kind of feed into your long term goals and, and hopes? I think that's right. Right. Okay, that's good. Um, and so um, let's see, what advice do you have for students already enrolled in a graduate program? Um, this question is a little bit general, but I'll say that I just think it's helpful for you to share with us any sort of um, additional academic experiences you're having. Some of the students that were admitted in the last cycle had um, had pursued other master's level coursework in other areas as well. Um, yes, you're very much welcome to, you know, just kind of treat that as you've treated your undergraduate experiences and share more about what types of things you've been working on during your master's level coursework. Laurel, I don't know if you have anything to add there. No, I, th I think that, that makes sense. Yeah, I would just treat it very similarly to how, you tr how you've treated your undergraduate study. And I mean, maybe it's helpful in a way to show your progression, you know, from kind of the more you know fundamental things you maybe have been working on in your undergrad and how you've kind of built in those areas. Um, but I wouldn't give it too much extra thought. And so I'm I think still it can completely... organically fit into your, um, you know, as you're talking about your goals, your goals are very often informed by the experiences that you've had to date. So just the same way that you might talk about what you chose to study in undergrad, if you've elected to go on to master's level coursework, it's probably because you've had an in-depth interest in a specific area or some degree, you know, perhaps you, you did a, a uh, you know, an MFA or something completely on the surface unrelated, and it may help to connect the dots for us why these two experiences make sense for you. Yeah, absolutely. And so someone asked about the fact that they're still completing their undergraduate degree at this time and asking if they're eligible to apply. And that is a yes, most definitely. So if you're still um, pursuing your undergraduate studies, what you'll do um, is you will apply for the January 13th deadline. You'll provide um, unofficial transcripts from any colleges or universities you've attended or are currently attending and share that information with us. And what you'll see once you've submitted your application is that there is a status portal that's available to you on your applicant status page. So you'll have a really handy page in which you can keep up to date on checklist items and make sure everything's coming in on time. You can see if your recommenders have submitted there. You can see if we've received your verified test scores there. But there's also a little box in which you can provide updated test scores and updated transcripts um, and any other information that might be helpful for us to know about. I always think in this area, it's important to keep your application uncluttered and very direct, right? But it's also important to make sure that we have all the facts, we have all the information, nothing is left uh, kind of just for us to be wondering about. So the more clear you can be about the things you're working on, where you stand in your classes, all of that information is really helpful to us. Um, 
So with that being said, I do encourage you to apply direct from undergraduate study, but just keep us posted, keep us updated on you and what you're working on. And of course, if admitted, we'll be reaching out to you later on in the summer to get the official transcripts. Um, one just small uh, caveat to that is um, we will certainly do our best throughout the round to incorporate new information. And in fact, we'll be looking for that new information if you are currently an undergrad because we want to know your, upgrade, your updated grades. Um, and uh, perhaps you know, at the point you enroll, uh, apply, you may not have even enrolled in your spring semester yet. So those are the sorts of updates we'll be looking for but we can't guarantee that we're going to be able to incorporate new information throughout the round. And so absolutely plan to have your testing done, for instance, prior to the round. If you get a new score, you are certainly welcome to submit it. But like I said, we just can't guarantee based on where we are in the round that we're going to go back and review an application again um, with that sort of new information. Absolutely. And to piggyback on that point, because we did receive a question asking if we accept GMAT and GRE scores after the deadline, we need a self-reported score at the time of your application submission. So if you're sitting for the test or taking it online, that's acceptable too for both GMAT and GRE. If you're doing that on the 13th, um, you can go ahead and take that test at noon, have your test takers copy and upload that to your application. And then be sure that when you did take the test, you requested to have the verified scores sent to us so that as promptly as possible, we can collect those um, once they're made available to us. So try your best, I, I, I think also for your own sanity, um, to be sure that you are thinking through your timeline for accomplishing all of the things that need to be done for your application, um, because we do require those um, self-reported scores for your application submission. But if you're retaking, as Laurel said, or if you, you know, feel you could do better on your test, the sooner the better when providing us those scores, if you would like for them to be considered by the committee, most definitely. Let's see. So I'm getting some questions about um, kind of how to, how to demonstrate interest in the program and also how to stand out in the application essays. So in terms of standing out in the application essays, I think Laurel made a very good point that these are 300 word limit essays and really it's not your typical, I wouldn't even say typical. It's, it's not like other business school essays where you're being asked to share a very personal story about yourself or you know, share about a particular time that you needed to accomplish a task and kind of walking us through that. This is very much very direct, the question that we're asking. And I think the most important thing to do is to, to answer the question and make sure that you're doing it um, as concisely and thoughtfully as possible. So I don't think it's necessary to stand out. And I think just in general, this, this feeling of needing to stand out, it's not really necessary. If you are someone that's put in the work, that is very passionate about this program and knows that this program will be um, a great thing for you to pursue, then I think that will shine through. So I, I know this is not very, um, this, this might be overstated by, by a lot of folks, but I, I truly believe this, and it's that you should just be your authentic self, present the facts clearly, concisely, thoughtfully, really be proud of what you're putting forth, and leave it up to us uh, for, at that point to review the information. As long as you've shared everything you feel is important for us to know, I think your application is going to be your best application. I don't know, Laurel, if you have any other thoughts on that point. No, I'm, I'm glad you took that question because this is one of my favorite ones to answer both for the MBA program and for this uh, program as well, because I think there is this perception in admissions that you have to stand out or kind of uh, make yourself you know, completely unique to the rest of the pool, which is really an impossible to ask to set you up for. You don't know who else is applying. And so I don't even know what the starting point is. And it's not how we're looking at applications. You know, Emily, I think you, you, know, you, said, it, you said it well. 
um, you know, for reference for our MBA program, I say we have room for lots of really great consultants and people working in finance and people working in nonprofit. You don't need to be the only one doing something. And we approach this similarly. There are lots of candidates um, and we can make room for who have outstanding academics and, and really nice professional or internship experience and have um, you know, demonstrated through the essays that they understand why this program makes sense for them and are excited about what they're going to get out of it and go out into the world and do. And so you don't need to worry so much about how you're doing that differently from anyone else. Just worry about how you present your own, uh, your own case and your own strengths and abilities in the best way possible. Yeah. And with that, let's get a little bit into um, talking about prerequisites. I guess there, there's a lot of questions coming in relating to prerequisites. So we will ask you for how many of each type of class um, you've, you've taken. So there will be a place for you to list how many statistics classes you've taken, how many calculus classes, how many economics classes, I think micro specifically. Um, and then you will share with us kind of the highest level course that you've completed um, in any of those particular areas. And so that just lets us see at a glance kind of what you've been working on and how much exposure you've had to certain concepts. Um, and similar of computer programming languages, we'll, we'll list a few different computer programming languages and see what exposures you've had to any of those. Um, now, as I said before, you can certainly apply direct from undergrad and you can be continuing to take classes and continuing to, um, to kind of brush up on certain skills. Maybe it's been a while since you've done any coding. Um, that is going to be something that you'll need to be successful in this program. There's no doubt about that. Um, but the question I got was asking about specific courses like Python and calculus. Um, so we certainly have um, recommendations to take multivariable calculus. And Python is something that we tend to recommend just because it's open source. So it's very easy for you to get some exposure and some experience in that area. MATLAB tends to be one that you need a university um, kind of login to, to get into using something like that. But really, um, Professor Moskowitz has reiterated that if you learned a specific programming language like R, but your professor is working in Python or MATLAB, it's pretty easy to transfer those skills. And also um, if you reach out to your professor and say, hey, I, I can absolutely do this, but I'd really like to do it in Python instead of R, most professors will be amenable to that. So it's just about getting that baseline knowledge set and getting that knowledge base. And then there's also a programming boot camp at the beginning of classes during orientation um, and a financial statement analysis kind of boot camp uh, during orientation. So it's a good way to level set and make sure everybody's got the skills that they need to continue being successful in the program. But there's plenty of pre-work you can do uh, to make sure that you have what you need in order to really shine in this program and make the most of your year um, getting into it. And so question about GPA for you, Laurel. Um, how will this program evaluate GPA and is there any specific cutoff or range? So, so once again, we are definitely looking at more than just your GPA at the, mm -hmm. at the end of your transcript. We are digging into what those individual courses are that you took, how you challenged yourself. Do you have the quantitative preparation um, to, to be able to, Kind of thrive in, in this program. We're looking at, as well at trajectory. So, um, you know, it's important to know if not everyone has the strongest start to their undergraduate career, but if you're making progress over time and, and things are looking better, that's a better pattern for us than the, the inverse. And so we're, you know, we're, we're really digging into that transcript and going beyond the GPA. Um, we, and, you know, as Emily mentioned before, we don't have sort of a, an inaugural class range to share with you, but above and beyond that, I mean, we're reviewing applications from all over the world that are on very different grading systems. Um, rest assured, we're familiar with a, a wide range of, of, uh, of grading systems, and so you don't need to kind of translate that for us in any way, but it's not even, I think, all that productive necessarily to say, well, here's the average GPA for, for a class. Um, 
there's definitely going to be a range and there's definitely going to be a lot of context that we take into account thinking you know from school to school and region to region and so again we're looking holistically at your academic profile and that's why we ask for different things like testing like academics like a professional rec or sorry a academic recommendation i mean that all of this sort of contributes to our understanding of whether you're prepared for the program Absolutely. And we're almost out of time. We're actually out of time, but I just really quickly wanted to uh, graze over this question. Someone was asking about two letters of recommendation from professionals instead of having one academic or if one academic is needed. The point of the academic letter of recommendation is for us to know your ability level in the classroom. Um, if you are kind of on the further end of work experience, you have four to five years, you haven't you know, talk to any of your professor contacts in a very long time, that's okay. I would recommend, you know, maybe choosing someone um, in your professional life that has seen you work, you know, on maybe a heavily quantitative project or can kind of highlight your exposure to certain skill sets that are a little bit more academic leaning. If there's been any kind of special research project you've been doing at work, that might be a, a good way to kind of hone in on your experiences there. Um, and also question, one other question about Rex, um, Yes, it's just two, we only want two. Um, but if you do have someone who's really passionate about you pursuing this program and wants to prepare another letter for you, you can certainly submit supplemental letters of support through our asset management um, email inbox. And we'll be happy to add those appropriately to your application. We just really want everyone to focus on following the directions closely and providing a really nice, clear application. So supplemental materials are certainly welcome and will be reviewed, but just this is a way to keep them in, a, in an appropriate place. Um, and I see some questions about SOM resources. Um, I'll close by saying we have a number of excellent previously recorded events, some questions about how does this relate to a master's in financial engineering program and how does this differ from a master's in finance program. I think Toby did a beautiful job of explaining that at our online reception and I highly recommend reviewing that. And for those with questions about the Career Development Office, Abigail Keyes, who's the Assistant Dean of that office and Joel Pearson, who works directly with our students, did a really beautiful job explaining the CDO and the types of resources you can access. So I highly recommend reviewing our previously recorded events section for that. But that's where we'll stop for today. Um, and thank you so much, Floral, for taking the time to walk through the application with us. It's been a pleasure. Okay, we're looking forward to getting your applications soon and start uh, reviewing them. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care and have a beautiful rest of your day and we'll be in touch soon. Don't forget, January 13th is the application deadline. <laughs> 5 p.m. Take care. Bye-bye.